Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar today and we're so excited to be hosting Jo Dale, um, our independent languages consultant from the UK who's got loads of really practical ideas to share with you today. So it's wonderful to have you here. Um, we really, we're so excited to have so many people from all around the world joining us um, and it's absolutely fantastic to have you here. So thank you for joining us. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Philippa Kruger. I'm the Head of Languages here at Education Perfect and I'll let Joe introduce himself um, in a second. Actually, Joe, do you want to introduce yourself now and then I'll launch into some housekeeping and then we'll go for it. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, so th first of all, a big thanks to um, Education Perfect for this opportunity. Um, uh, my, as you know, my name is Joe Dale. I'm a former languages teacher. I taught French for 13 years uh, at secondary school level for three years and then 10 years at middle school level on the Isle of Wight in the UK, which is where I live. Um, and I've lived here for over 20 years. And for the last 10 years or so, I've been an independent languages consultant. And I normally travel around the world running training on the use of technology and languages as well as across the curriculum. But of course, since the pandemic, I've had to do everything via webinar. So it's an absolute pleasure to be here with everyone tonight and especially to, to be hosted by Philippa as well. It's brilliant. Wonderful. Thank you, Joe. And so um, for today's session, obviously the theme um, is exploring how to engage, support and assess language learning in a remote and blended learning environment. And we're very aware that people in the audience are really coming from all sorts of different situations around the world. So we've got some people who are still in the full um, remote learning situation, some people who might have some form of blended learning. Um, we've got other teachers I know who are, run distance learning programs um, and in countries where um, that schools may be back in on-campus learning but they're still running their standard distance learning programs and we've also got teachers who um, are sort of not um, currently in, in remote le learning due to lockdown but um, have got loads of questions for Joe just about online learning in general so thank you so much in advance to everyone who's um, submitted questions. We had we were inundated with questions. I think we had over 60 questions. So Joe's going to do his best to get through these. Um, we've divided them up into sections, so we'll kind of address the questions in different groups. And at the end of each group, I'll just give a quick EP perspective on the different questions as well. Um, and then, um, yeah, we'll see how much we get through. And if we don't manage to get through all the questions, Joe and I thought we might plan a follow-up session um, in a couple of weeks' time. So. Um, do not fear if we don't get to your question, we'll, we'll run another session if we don't manage to get through everything. So before we sort of launch into it, I'll just go through the housekeeping quickly. So you can move the windows around on the screen in front of you as much as you wish. Um, there are links in the bio section on the left hand side of the screen if you want to get in touch with Joe or myself following the session. Um, in the resource list, you'll find links to our EP site um, and our help centre and also our uh, Hopefully, is there our EP Languages um, Facebook page, which we'd love you to join as well. Um, and there's also a Q&A section that you can ask questions at any time. So please feel free to pop your questions in there. And um, either I'll try and answer the questions as we go, or I'll get Joe maybe at the end of each section, we could have a look at the questions in there and see if we can sort of answer some of those. Um, at the end of the webinar, you'll be able to click on the certificate icon at the bottom of the screen. And this will let you download a certificate to recognise your attendance in the webinar today. And if you found the webinar helpful, you can feel free to fill out the send this webinar box and it will send a link of the recording to a colleague um, and they'll be able to view it. And finally, you'll also receive a recording of the session. Um, so it will send out an email 24 hours after it finishes and you'll be able to access the recording. Um, and we'll also send out Joe's slideshow as well. So Joe's got a very um, extensive slideshow with loads of links in it. So you'll receive that when you receive the recording of the session. So you'll be able to access all of those links as well. Um, so um, without further ado, we'll sort of move on to our first section. Um, and the first section is exploring practicing speaking in a remote and blended learning environment. So there are a number of questions um, regarding speaking. And so I'll hand over to Joe and he can, um, he can take it from there. So the first slide here um, shows um, the first few questions. So um, well, I'll let Joe take it from there. Fantastic. Thank you so, ever so much, Philippa. So, um, yeah, as uh, Philippa said, we had six, about 60 different questions all coming in. Um, for me to uh, for me to go through and try and work out um, how to organise them under themes and how to uh, address each uh, issue, I will try my best to go through some of those questions to, um, today. We won't be able to cover all of them, but as uh, Philippa said, 
Uh, the plan is in a couple of weeks' time, if there's enough interest uh, for me to come back and to do um, some more questions later on. But it's been an absolute uh, pleasure to, to try and answer your questions. And I think these sorts of clinics, again, as Philippa has said, uh, that everyone's in a different context. I think it's um, it's uh, it, it's fantastic. So, uh, Philip will be will be collecting questions. Feel free to write your questions in the Q and A while we're we're going along. Um, and um, at uh, relevant moments during the presentation, we can then address some extra questions if they come in. Um, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna crack on now with the first question, which is: Could you give us some ideas to help students participate more in speaking activities during an online lesson? Some of my students are a bit shy and do not want to speak; they only want to type. So this is a this is a common uh, issue that lots of different teachers who I know uh, have come across, uh, and I'll be addressing that in a second. And the second question, which is very similar, how do you engage students in speaking practice in an online learning environment? Because of course, if um, you're not allowed to be face to face with with um, uh, your students, how do you uh, get them to practice their speaking? And so, uh, if we go on to the next slide, if that's okay, Philippa, um, that's lovely. Um, this is an article. Um, I wrote for the Modern Languages Teachers Lounge uh, Facebook group, which is a, uh, a group organized by Linguascope. And um, the, this article, it took me a couple of days to write it. I really sort of shared all my experience around different ideas on speaking uh, practice as well as uh, audio feedback, uh, looking at a sort of Microsoft environment, uh, at a Google environment, and, and any sort of, you know, any sort of environment whereby you, you can use different tools, some of which I'll be talking about um, a bit later on as well. Different tools for, for example, speaking homeworks, uh, different tools which allow everybody to participate synchronously at the same time, or uh, tools which, which allow you to submit um, audio files asynchronously. Um, lots and lots of different ideas. So I think, I think you should find that really useful. Um, as as Philip has said, the the links will be or the the presentation will be uh, shared with you later, and all the links which I'm referring to are all uh, in each slide, and there are lots and lots of links, um, so you should find it really useful. So the second link there is uh, a Google Doc, which includes the article, um, and uh, the the first link is a direct link to the Facebook group as well. Okay, if we could go on to the next slide, if that's okay. So. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go through a couple of ideas which um, I think are great for encouraging students to speak, and that's using um, the Google tool called Jamboard. Now, um, if, you, if you don't have Google accounts, then um, you can still take part in a Jamboard as a student, uh, but not in the app version, in the, in the web-based version. But um, to create a Jamboard, you do need to have a Google account. You can have similar, there are similar tools, the Jamboard. For example, there's the Microsoft Whiteboard, which is part of, um, of Teams, which you could use to do similar activities. Or there's third party tools such as Whiteboard.chat, um, which also allow you to uh, create these sort of collaborative uh, spaces for students to work. So if you haven't seen Jamboard before, it's a really fantastic um, tool, I think. Uh, and it allows you to create this collaborative space. You are able to add in images and sticky notes and write in text, uh, and you can uh, rub things out as well. I've seen some nice examples of a scratch card whereby you have the different answers on the screen, and then you have the, uh, the sort of the paint over the top of each answer, and then the teacher or the students could then scratch out the paint to reveal the answer underneath. But one way, certainly, I think, which is great for uh, encouraging students to speak is by playing games. And I think traditional games always seem to go down well in the languages classroom, uh, or, or should I say outside of the languages classroom in this context. And so one suggestion uh, is to play a game like um, Battleships. So in this example, um, what I'm suggesting here is that you would take the Battleships board and you would paste it across uh, two separate frames within Jamboard. So in Jamboard, you can have up to 20 frames uh, and you can have up to 50 people taking part in the one Jamboard. But I'm suggesting that you could, for example, um, in, say, Google Classroom, you could make uh, a, an assignment whereby you give a, a Google Jamboard to each student or get the students to work together in a, in a pair. And, of course, the idea would be that they don't go and look at each other's frames. Otherwise, that would be cheating. It would be a waste of time. But Battleships is a, is a, is a classic uh, um, in this particular context. I'm suggesting that you're using it for practicing the uh, verb paradigm of uh, in me, to like or to love, 
and of course what they have to do is they have the little the little battleships and they just uh, arrange them onto their uh, board in the way that they want to and then they have to say the phrase um while they're um while they're practicing or they could write the phrase in the chat if they prefer while they're practicing the different uh, activities uh, and that's how that would that's how that would work and i think that's a great way of being able to encourage um speaking for sure uh, in a in a game like environment you'll see at the bottom as well um that i've got the link to the jam board i actually if you click on that link it will actually give you a further 20 ideas um of how to use jam board and if you do a search for jam board plus my name on twitter you'll find uh, there are actually three links that i've done of which there are 20 frames in each link so there are actually 60 ideas that i've shared on twitter many times if you just do a search for joe dale jam board you'll find it but this, um, the link that I've shared there is actually directly um, working with uh, this particular um, game here. If we go on to the next slide, Philip, if that's okay. Another, another classic, Noughts and Crosses, very, very straightforward and simple. Again, you could do the same thing in uh, Microsoft Whiteboard or using um, uh, whiteboard.chat. Um, so here, as you can see, what I've done is I've created the, the Noughts and the Crosses. I've removed the background, so you can just drag and drop them over the uh, images. When you uh, go for, for the image search in Google uh, Jamboard, you can then just find uh, a whole range of different royalty-free images and just put them straight in. So it's really, really nice. And again, you could do that as a whole class activity if you wanted, or as I've said already, you could assign um, one jam per student and get them to play that way uh, in pairs if you wanted to. And as you can see, I've taken the um, the emojis there for the noughts and crosses um, from emoji.co.uk, which is a nice website which allows you to find uh, larger versions of your favorite emojis. And then you can obviously just drag and drop them straight into your your Jamboard, a lot, along with lots of other things. If you're a fan of Bitmojis, for example, you can just drag and drop Bitmoji straight into your Jamboard as well. So that's another another idea. If we go to the next slide, that's okay. Um, the next one, this, this took me a lot of time to produce. Um, so this is, of course, Guess Who? And what I did was I um, put together a, a Google Slides um, uh, presentation. I asked people in the MFL Twitterati, the community of language teachers, language consultants like myself, and language associations from the uh, from the UK and from Ireland. Uh, I asked people if they could post their uh, Bitmojis onto the uh, onto the presentation, and I think within a day or so, I had over a hundred different Bitmojis to choose from. So I've used them in a variety of ways, but in this particular example, I made the the game Guess Who, and so what I did was. Uh, I took their headshots and I saved them uh, into Keynote. Um, I removed the background using what's called Instant Alpha in Keynote, which essentially allows you to move the background very, very easily. There are, there's a web-based tool called remove.bg. That's R-E-M-O-V-E dot B-G, which also allows you to move the background. You can remove a background in PowerPoint as well. But it so happened I was using Keynote. Um, I then just uh, put them together onto... Their, their own individual cards, put the name on, etc., and then I just repeated the process uh, many, many times. So it took me about three hours to, put, to do that particular slide, um, but it was worth it. And I've seen people on Twitter have been playing this game with um, different language sheets, which I think is hilarious, personally. Um, and yeah, just the, the classic um, guess who. Again, I probably would recommend that this was done as a as a whole class activity, I think. But again, a, a great way to encourage students to uh, to speak for sure. So those are a few ideas around uh, game playing. And then if we go on to the next slide, if that's okay. Um, so this one, uh, this is all about Genially. I don't know if anyone is a fan of Genially. I can't actually see the chat, but that's fine. Um, if anyone's a fan of Genially, but um, I've uh, I've done a couple of um, webinars recently um, uh, for Genially with uh, the amazing Marie Alliro, uh and also uh, Julia Morris, who appeared in the second uh, Genially webinar. So if you're looking for ideas around uh, gamifying your classroom, playing games, encouraging speaking, um, I would really encourage you to check out both of those webinars because uh, they're really, really, really fantastic. In fact, the first one has already been watched over 3,000 times, which is incredible. And uh, I know that Marie and Julia have also set up a Facebook group, um, which is available. The link is available there on the screen as well. Um, but for example, in the second one, um, Marie and uh, Julia have shared different games such as uh, Connect Four and other such um, traditional games that um, they've adapted and made in, in Genely. And also one of the questions was asking about um, escape rooms as well and how 
uh, how do you uh, use escape rooms if, uh, for example, uh, Google is is blocked? I know in Queensland, for example, there are lots of um, uh, Google tools that are generally blocked, um, but they're not in Victoria. But anyway, that's another that's another issue. So I would say to that person, try genially, and in particular, these two um, uh, these two webinars. And if you go onto my YouTube channel, which is Joe Dale One Hundred then you'll find uh, many, many, many more webinars, either ones that I've uh, done personally or ones that I've hosted or all the TILT webinars, where, you know, TILT stands for Technology and Language Teaching. And uh, you'll find lots there as well. In fact, I think that's where the original um, person who asked the question, that's where they found the original one. So uh, uh, Marie has also done a TILT webinar for us as well on Genially, and uh, Julia did one for us on Google Sites as well. So I, I hear what you're saying when if... if um, Google tools are blocked, so you, you can't access certain tools. But again, in this in this webinar, as, as with, with any webinar, I'm, I'm just going to present the things which I know have been you know tried and tested by different people. And if they're blocked in your certain area, I would get onto the local authorities and ask if they could be unblocked, giving examples of how they're being used very really successfully um, in uh, in language learning. So hopefully that ans uh, answers the question around encouraging students to speak by playing games and so on and so forth. And, of course, there are lots and lots of other little games as well that you can play. Um, and um, I've also shared, actually, on this on this slide as well, the the Padlet, which Marie has put together, which has lots of different genies that she's made, escape rooms and other games, etc. So that should be really, really useful for you, which she's very generously shared on Twitter and on the Facebook group as well. OK, let's go on to the next slide, if that's OK. Uh, so, again, around speaking, um, how can you promote communication with the target language in large classroom settings e.g. 30 students in a class. Uh, what are some successful ways you have found to get students to submit work through means other than the written form? Uh, so a multimodal approach. Um, and is there a simple method where students can easily post their sound recordings into Google Classroom? So again, I'm going to go through the different options here and see what comes up. So the first one, if we go on to the next slide, the uh, the first two I'm going to talk about, I'm big fans of both of these. Um, the first one on the left-hand side, I presented this a, a few times in different webinars recently, um, and it's called Quicker Conversations. So Quicker Conversations, or Quicker in general, uh, is a, it's a free tool which uh, was developed by a physics teacher in the southwest of England um, a couple of years ago. And it allows you to have two main functions. The first function is to, uh, to download a, a sheet of... Um, uh, of different QR codes, and then you can then uh, scan each QR code and you can record some audio for that individual QR code, and then you can then um, print out the, the, the PDF, cut it up, and then stick it um, in exercise books or, or wall displays uh, or use it for audio feedback um, on, on praise postcards if you want digital praise postcards. Uh, that's one way of using Quicker. But the way that I'm particularly enthusiastic about is the quicker conversations option which is brilliant for role play practice for conversation uh, and so on and so forth so the way that it works is you need to have an account as a teacher but once you've got your account you then click on the create instant feedback option you you click on uh, the quicker conversations icon which is like a, a purple circle with two little speech bubbles in you click on that and then you then are able to um, uh, record your audio, you click on the audio option, you record your audio. I don't think there's a limit on how long you can record for, which is brilliant. And then once you've recorded your audio, you can also, if you want to add a photo, you can add in text and a web link, and then you can then uh, click on view your quicker conversation. So I normally just, when I'm demoing it, I normally just record some audio. I then click on the view your quicker conversation. It takes you to a new page. And then you've got the audio player there where you can listen back to the audio. You can also right click that audio player and you can um, uh, you can download the audio if you want to, because it's deleted automatically after three months. But if you want to keep the audio permanently, you can just download it. Once you've done that, you can then share the link with the students, be it in Google Classroom or Microsoft Teams or or in the chat in whatever video conferencing you're using, uh, be it Zoom or what have you. They can then click on that link. And then they also get the uh, the audio, um, the microphone coming up, and they can click on uh, record, and they can then record their uh, their bits of audio, and it will then all appear in the one thread. 
You can uh, moderate the conversation as well, which is brilliant from the teacher's point of view. So it means that when uh, the students' audio players appear, it will say uh, approve or delete. So it means as the teacher, you can then choose whether you allow the, um, the player to appear or not. So the only person that would see it would be uh, yourself or obviously the student that sent it. Um, but if you're happy with what they've recorded, you just click approve and then all the audio players all appear in the one place. And at the bottom, there's the padlock option. So you can lock the, um, the padlock if you want to, which means they can no longer submit audio to that particular link. So in other words, the way that you can use it, you can create your, your starting audio, share it with the students. They can then use it as a back and forth uh, role play conversation uh, option whereby maybe you share one link with two students and then they can then practice that. They could do that asynchronously. They could do that as a homework task. Uh, if they're working in, in groups in, say, breakout rooms, you could give one link to each breakout room. They could then do a summary of their what they've been talking about in their breakout rooms, for example. You could use it as a way of presenting um, a presentation, and then um, the, the students then give uh, audio feedback, maybe, or vice versa. Uh, you could ask one question in the target language, and then the whole class all answers uh, and can, can get to listen to everyone else's if you've approved them, if you've turned on moderation. Uh, so there's lots and lots of ways. So, so a little bit like Flipgrid, but but audio only. And so I think that's a great way of encouraging the students to speak. Uh, if you've got, say, th all 30 in the class, they can all do it at the same time. And uh, when I've demoed it in other webinars, it, it works really, really well. On the right-hand side, uh, the second screenshot there, that's from a, um, a webinar that I did for Quartisol uh, recently. On Flipgrid, I've done many, many on my YouTube channel on Flipgrid. And um, I know that, well, my understanding is I think in Queensland, um, Flipgrid in, in some schools is, is blocked, which I find very uh, disappointing, but never mind. Um, but Flipgrid, again, if you don't know about Flipgrid, the key idea is that it's similar to sort of quicker, but it's it's based on video, essentially. You don't have to, you don't have to appear on the video. You can have it. So it's um, what they call mic only, which means that uh, it's a white background with a little blue microphone instead of your actual uh, picture in your in your camera. But it's a great way of being able to uh, record a question in the target language. It appears on a grid. Everyone in the class, you create, you create your own sort of private classes, and they can then record their answers. They all appear on the grid. Uh, you can give people feedback, either public feedback. In other words, all the people in the grid can then see that feedback or individual private feedback if you want to. You can give written feedback, you can give uh, audio feedback, you can give video feedback, and it also allows you to have lots of um, other options, such as you can uh, pixelate your face if you don't want to appear as yourself. You can add in emojis, you can add in frames, you can add in uh, text boxes, you can split your screen in two um, and uh, draw on, say, on the right-hand side of the screen where your video appears on the left-hand side of the screen, like a, a sort of a flip learning screencast um, outcome. There's lots and lots of different things that you can do. So I think for encouraging speaking, um, for flip learning, because we had another question about the advantage of a flip learning, in other words, freeing up more time in the in the lesson by creating a video that then appears in the, the student's Flipgrid is a really nice idea. And also the fact that um, with Flipgrid, it works on all devices, as does Quicker as well. And with Flipgrid, you need to have the app to record um, your, your videos. But again, a, a great way of encouraging speaking. If you just do a search for Flipgrid, plus say MFL Twitterati or, or Flipgrid and languages, then you'll find lots of people from around the world who have been using Flipgrid, um, not only during the pandemic, but I think um, you know for years, uh, for quite a few years now. It was acquired by Microsoft a few years ago, and I think it's a really fantastic tool. And so, if you watch that particular um, Quartisol webinar, it will go through all the different ways in which you can, in which you can use it. If we go to the next slide, please, Philippa, if that's okay. So. Um, I was also asked about uh, different ways of submitting uh, work which is not written. And I think that if we're talking about submitting speaking homework, then I think these um, different options can certainly help with that. So um, I'm sure everyone knows Vokaroo, but Vokaroo has been around for a long time. It's an absolute classic. It used to be that it didn't work on iPads and then they completely rebuilt it so that um, uh, it, it works now on what's called HTML5, which means it will work on all devices, which is just great. So a really simple and easy way of recording audio, creating a link, and then you can then ask the students to send you uh, the link as a as a teacher. You could put that in a in a Google form or a Microsoft form as a as a quick way of collecting those links, or just ask them to 
to send it to you via whichever LMS you're using. You can export the uh, the link as a QR code as well, which means, again, you could copy and paste that QR code and put it into um, a, a document for audio feedback or maybe in a praise postcard. Um, likewise, you've got SpeakPipe, which is very similar. SpeakPipe voice recorder uh, allows you to record up to five minutes, as does Vokaroo, uh, and then it generates a link, so a nice way of doing speaking homeworks. With Vokaroo as well, it used to be that uh, you could only have your audio there for three months, but I saw on Twitter a couple of days ago they've actually extended that to a whole year. So you can actually have the audio there for a whole year before it's deleted. And apparently if it's accessed a lot, the audio, um, it will it will last for even longer. So with SpeakPipe, it's only three months, but Vokra, it's now uh, a whole year. You've also, on the right-hand side there, you've got um, a website called Record MP3 Online that allows you to um, also... Uh, record some audio, give the students a link, a little bit like quicker. They all record their audio, and then it all appears in your uh, in your account, in your audio folder. So in that situation, the students wouldn't be able to hear each other's audio. So depending on whether you want that or you don't want that, then that's another option. Uh, you do need to create an account with that. You don't need to create an account with Vokaroo or, or SpeakPipe, so that might be simpler from that point of view. And then on the bottom right there, Padlet. I know that's been around for a long time but not everybody knows that there's a voice recording feature in Padlet. So you can create different um, columns, for example, if you would like, um, using what's called the shelf format, which allows you to create different columns, which you can then name. So I know um, uh, some people, what they do is they have the first column as the teacher audio. So they, the teacher records, say, 10 questions in the target language, and then the students get one column each, and then they can all record their, their answers based on the questions that, that the teacher has asked. Uh, you've also got the possibility of feedback, written feedback as well in Padlet. So that's really cool. Um, and a little screenshot there, that's from a, a teacher, a, a language teacher in London who shared that on Twitter recently. And then finally, in the middle there, you've got the app Voice Record Pro, which um, is a it's a fantastic iOS and Android app, which allows you to record MP3 files and M M4A files as well. And you've got the share um, straight to Google Drive option, or you could choose the um, uh, share and then you choose the Google Classroom app if you wanted to. So that's another great way of being able to uh, upload straight to Google um, Google Classroom. But in certainly with Voku and SpeakPipe, you could just record the audio and then just paste paste it into uh, some feedback in Classroom. But if you wanted to upload the audio, Voice Record Pro would be a great option uh, that works on um, iOS and on Android. And if you're looking for say another web based solution for recording audio, another one which I've not got there is. Um, onlinevoicerecorder.com, onlinevoicerecorder.com, another way of recording audio and uploading it straight to um, Google Drive and connecting it with Classroom. So and, uh, lots and lots of different um, ideas there. Hopefully that's um, answered everyone's question. Now the next the next one, if you go on to the next slide, if that's okay. This is a classic question which has been coming up a lot during the, the pandemic. Um, how can you get students to speak and put on their cameras? How can we engage students to open their cameras and speak more often instead of using the online chat? So. Both of these questions um, completely independently were asked, uh, both address the same issue. And when I was asked this question before in another presentation, uh, these are the answers which I, uh, I um, uh, was, was given as a result of asking on the, on the MFL Twitter RT uh, community. So if we go to the next slide, if that's okay. So now we're on the slide, encouraging students to open their cameras and unmute. And I know that's quite small, but I'll just, um, for, if it is too small, I'll just read out some of these answers. So you can see that we've got uh, Senorita Taylor saying, taking a register at the beginning where you say, I'd like to hear who is present today. So do unmute yourselves and say, hola, bonjour, etc." That's all very well, but what do you do if they refuse to do that? <laughs> um, but I think that's a nice, nice little routine at the beginning, uh, just to show that people are actually there and they haven't just, you know, they haven't just logged in and then they're off playing a game or something. Um, Sarah is saying, I do that, and the response is silence. Jamboard or chat is the only way my students will communicate. So based on the ideas I've shared already, uh, obviously she's finding that if they're doing an activity like Jamboard or some sort of collaborative game, it is meaning that they have to speak, and therefore that's why they maybe are doing that, which is lovely. Emma saying, I have my register in front of me and tick off as I ask them questions. Mine know that I'll ask them, so they are now prepared to come off mute, which is which is good, establishing that routine. Uh, uh, Frau Barnes, I type the question into chat with some options. Students click on uh, on one with an emoji response. Not all students have a mic, and our cameras have to be off. So that's interesting as well. I don't know if it's true in 
in Australia compared to the UK. But I would say in the UK, uh, from a safeguarding point of view, there are lots of schools which don't allow the students to have, say, live lessons. Uh, everything has to be done asynchronously, so making screencasts and uh, setting homework tasks and that sort of thing. Um, so in in um, in her school, Frau Barnes's school, as you can see, um, that uh, they're, they're told the cameras have to be off. So that's a different question in itself. We then got uh, Miss Little, Stephanie Little. In Scotland, uh, cameras must remain off for safeguarding reasons, as I've just said. And Mike's, as a general rule, we communicate through chatbots. This is also a union advice, OK? So that's another perspective. Uh, Fiona Joyce, cameras and mics not used at my school. I try repeatedly verbally and via the chat to get them to respond. If nothing, uh, I add in info to school spreadsheet where absence of failure to in engage are reported and then the pastoral team is contacted. So if there are students who are regularly not um, taking part, not um, turning on their, their webcams, then, of course, as a teacher, you can make a note of that. I suppose that's more of a sort of a negative way of looking at things, but certainly, uh, as with any... Um, uh, any, any, you know, poor behaviour, if you like, if you see it like that, um, could be noted. And as a result of that, uh, the the uh, pastoral team could be then contacted and then find out why it is that particular child does not doesn't want to turn on their webcam. Um, a nice one here from Yamina. They usually feel more comfortable to communicate via the chat. I have lots that prefer this option. Using the whiteboard or team on Teams and online is also a good alternative that works. Again, going back to what I've said already. Uh, Again, for our I type the question into the chat with some options. Students click on one with emoji response. I've seen that in other examples as well, particularly in Teams, when you can sort of give a thumbs up or a thumbs down on a comment as well. But, of course, that's not encouraging them to speak. It's encouraging them to collaborate but not to speak. And then um, uh, the last one, all my students have to participate in the class, answering questions, reading or writing the answers. If anyone does not answer, I just joke about saying they, they fell asleep or asking them, are you awake? If you don't answer... I just skipped them. By the way, they're all with cameras off. Interesting. Okay, so they got their cameras off, but they got their microphones on. So again, it depends on, I suppose, the relationship one has with the with the class. And I'm not saying this is easy, but these are some of the responses which um, practicing language teachers have given. So let's uh, let's go on to the next question, if that's okay. What? Ah, oh, this is a great question. What platforms or websites are you aware of that allow for interaction with native speakers? So. Um, Clearly, you know, I could mention lots of different um, uh, lots of different tools such as Buzu and, and tools like that, B-U-S-U-U. -U, but these are uh, these are tools which are designed for adults, not for children. And therefore, I'm not recommending that. What I am recommending is a tool which I I know that the person behind this is a guy called Charlie Foote. And that's uh, uh, Billy, B-I-L-I. Um, so what Billy do, um, they've been going for a few years now. They they have lots of different schools they're connecting, connected with around Europe, likewise in the UK as well. And so when a school tries to find a partner, they then will go in and they will uh, set up that partnership. And it's all very, very safe and moderated. And um, uh, if you're looking for a way in which you can uh, communicate with native speakers, then I think that Billy certainly would be a great website to to go to. I'm, I'm not as sure of the equivalent in Australia, but certainly you could, uh, if you wanted to connect with a class in, say, France or in Germany, uh, etc., then I think that um, uh, Charlie would love to hear from you, and you could then go from there. So there we are. So that sort of summarised some of those answers. Hopefully everyone's happy with what I've done so far. And now I'm going to hand back to uh, to Philippa to give us um, a perspective on how EP can answer and address some of these questions that have been posed by the audience. Great, thank you, Joe. That was certainly a lot of ideas to consider. So many tools that you've um, covered there, um, and so many different ideas. And um, if you like, we've said throughout the session, um, well, this this slideshow will be sent to you so you can have all of those links that you can click on if you want to refer back to them. Um, I'm just going to try and give a really quick perspective on how EP can also help with speaking in a remote learning situation. Um, so I'm going to go into screen share really quickly to just to show you a couple of things. Um, so bear with me, hopefully in a, couple, in a minute you'll be able to see my screen. Um, so when you um, are using EP now, I'm not sure that probably we've got a, different, a variety of people online. Some people may have used EP before, some people might not have. Um, but essentially, 
within EP, we've got a whole library of pre-built content and we've got content available at all different levels and it covers all, all skills. Um, so listening, reading, writing and speaking. So I'm just going to jump in and have a quick look at our speaking lessons. Um, and these are available in many different languages. I'm just showing you an example in French. So for each of our topic based authentic units, um, we have a speaking lesson. And I'm just going to show you what it looks like from the student perspective. So basically, when the students start the lesson, they do a bit of focus on pronunciation. So they've got some a list of words. They can preview the words and listen to them. And then when they launch into it, they do a quick microphone check. They record themselves saying, they press and hold, hold space bar. They record themselves saying the word. Um, and then it will play back their answer and compare it to a model answer. So great for practicing um, pronunciation and it's all kind of, it takes away a lot of the fear of doing it in front of people. So it's great for doing it at home. They don't have to do it um, in a Zoom room or anything. They could just do it independently and they can repeat as many times as they like. So they can really focus on that pronunciation. We then have pronunciation at sentence level, so same kind of thing, except they've got a sentence that they read and record themselves and compare it to a model answer. Um, we've then got a series of questions targeting conversation skills, so where the students listen to a question and then record their answer. So they play the question and um, they played, sorry, my three-year-old's just woken up. It's, it's 10 to 20 to 7 here in New Zealand in the morning, so she's just woken up, but I think she's occupied, so that's all good. Um, so they play the question, and then they record their answer. So it's really practicing those conversational skills, and there's a whole series of those that they can work through for each unit. And then we have the flip side of the conversation where the students listen to an answer, and they've got to record a question. So obviously it's not the same as having a conversation in real life, but it's really good for just keeping those um, that, that speaking practice going. And then we've got a few activities at the end where they've either got to record themselves talking about the topic or record a conversation with a partner, which they can do in a Zoom breakout room um, um, and, or a sort of online environment. Um, so that's, a, that's a, an overview of our speaking lessons. And all of this as well... Um, Teachers can look at what the students and listen to what the students have recorded and give feedback. And you can actually give verbal feedback too. Um, as well as the pre-built activities there, it's also possible for teachers to create their own speaking lessons um, in those kind of styles. It's really easy to do that. Um, and um, as well as that, on top of that, a lot of the activities that Joe mentioned, as, if there's an embed code, you can actually embed those activities into our EP lessons as well. So um, that's something else to consider if you are using EP a lot already and you think, oh, I'd like to sort of venture and combine, consolidate a lot of my different resources and use try some of these new activities. You can actually copy our lessons, edit them, and add in some of those activities that Joe mentioned. So that's a very quick overview. Um, and if you don't have an EP account, I'll put up a link at the end and you can sign up for a, um, a free trial of EP for, for a month and have a look at what it's like. And um, I'll pass back over to Joe now. Um, I'll stop my screen share and um, I'll let Joe continue. Fantastic. Thanks ever so much, Philip. That's brilliant. So things like Genially and Flipgrid, you'll be able to embed into um, EP, no problem at all. Any of the tools that has the embed code, you can just... Um, pull it straight into EP and uh, and go from there. That's fantastic. So those are all the questions that we did on speaking. The second um, um, theme is around engagement. Again, this came up a lot during the session. Uh, sorry, dur during the, uh, the questions that were coming in, lots of ideas around how do you keep the students engaged, particularly if you've been doing, let's say, remote teaching or a blended approach for, for over a year, as we all have been doing. Um, that's a really key uh, key idea. So here, here are some of the questions that come up. So if we go onto the slide with the uh, starting off with what is your favorite engagement method? So as you can see here, we've got three questions, all very similar. What is your favorite engagement method for online full class learning? How to engage young learners when doing online courses? And how do we sustain student engagement? So essentially, they're all asking the same, uh, the same thing. So there are lots of potential answers for this, but I'm just going to share some of the answers which uh, certainly language teachers in the UK um, have found really, really useful for engaging their students. And the first one I'm going to talk about is Blookit. Uh, Blookit has proved incredibly popular. Um, I've seen lots of people tweeting about it in the MFL Twisterati. Uh, essentially, it's a very sort of game-like approach. Uh, I talked about games earlier and the power for that, for encouraging them to speak. But um, Blookit, uh, what it allows you to do, you can either create your uh, game from scratch or you can import um, 
your Quizlet sets into Look it, or you can uh, search for Quizlet sets and copy the link, uh, the embed code, should I say, sorry, and then put it straight into Look it from there as well. So that's probably the easiest thing that you can do, in fact, rather than making from scratch. You've already got lots of Quizlets that you've made. You can put it straight into Look it. So what Look it allows you to do, you have access to a number of different um, activities, uh, sort of a, a classic racing type activity. There's one when you have to steal each other's gold which uh, seems to be the one that produces the most tweets um, when uh, the teacher's uh, gold is, is stolen by all the, the, the students by uh, uh, much to their uh, enjoyment and uh, completely free as everything else is that I'm talking about tonight. Um, so it's essentially, it's, it's sort of uh, multiple choice activities, but, but, but um, presented in a gamified manner. So if you haven't seen it before, I would really encourage you to have a look at that one. Here are some of the features um, I'll just uh, go through some of these now. As you see, very, very visually appealing and easy to use. It doesn't require any prep at all, um, particularly if you just imported uh, different quiz that sets in. It's competitive fun. No login required for the students, which is always um, a good thing if we can um, create these, uh, sorry, do these sorts of activities without the students having to log in. And that's absolutely brilliant. And you've got, a as you can see, a range of different activities such as Crazy Kingdom, Tower of Doom, um, Battle Royale, Gold Quest, that's the, the gold, uh, uh, that's the one when you can steal each other's gold, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then it just gives you an idea of if you wanted to upgrade of how much it would cost um, the year for having your own folders. But in fact, um, the people I know who've used this have said, just use the free version. You do not need to upgrade at all. Um, with that in mind, um, I talked about the, the different um, Tilt webinars earlier. Um, in January, when we went straight back into lockdown after the Christmas break, um, we did a couple of webinars almost straight away. I think the first Saturday after we went into lockdown, I think on the Tuesday, we had um, a show and tell as part of the Tilt webinar series. And the second one, which is where this video has been taken from, we had um, a teacher talking all about uh, Blookit and how it can be set up. Um, and you'll find not only... Uh, that webinar has four different um, tools which are mentioned. One, another one, which is uh, Spiral.ac, which I'd really encourage you to have a look at from the point of view of giving feedback to the students and for retrieval practice. Uh, there's Blookit. There's there's a variety of other different tools um, which have uh, proved really popular. So Blookit for sure is a really, really good one, I think, to start off with. Um, another tool which has proved really popular um, during the lockdown is WordWall. So WordWall uh, is... Uh, you do have um, a free tier, and with the free tier, you can make up to five different activities. What I mean by that, activity types. So once you've chosen your activity type, you can actually make as many activities from that activity type as you would like. And with the uh, the free version, you get access to 18 activity types, of which you have to choose five. But what some people do is they they pay for a month, which I think is about $5 or something, they create lots and lots of activities with the wider range of activities. They then stop their paid account, and then they just use the uh, uh, the activities that they made during that one month because they're not deleted once you um, stop um, paying for the premium version. So that's uh, something which I know some people have done. Um, now, here, here is um, a slide which gives you an idea on the sorts of activities you can do. You've got things like Random Wheel. Uh, you've got um, sort of gap fill type activities, uh, reordering activities, unjumbling activities, matching activities. Um, I know these are used at primary. We had a question about primary um, as well uh, that was posted to us. We had a question around primary and secondary. So I think a sort of um, starter activities or uh, a, a, a sequence of activities you could do during um, remote or blended lesson. WordWall is a really, really nice tool to, to look at. And if you wanted to invest in, in the full version, then I think that would be a good idea as well, for sure. And I'm not paid to say that at all. Um, this is just my own independent advice. Again, here are some of the features uh, that I've talked about already. So you, you get five editable templates for free. Uh, you can edit your content and reuse the template as many times as you want to. There are also lots of activities that have been created already within the community section, which you can then bookmark and edit them and, and make them your own as well, which is fantastic. Um, there's also some printable activities. So for maybe students who don't have access to a good internet connection at home, you can make printable activities and share those with them as paper copies. Um, so lots and lots of different things that you could do there. Now, 
on the next slide, Philippa, if that's okay, this is the one, the Tilt Webinars Word Wall one. We've got two different video clips. Um, the first one on the left hand side, that's from Glenn Cake, who is a Canadian uh, teacher who's been teaching distance learning for many, many years. And he um, did a, a tilt webinar for us all around different formative assessment tools, including WordWall. He also showed us GimKit and Kahoot and, and, other, and other tools. But the WordWall one was particularly uh, interesting, I thought. And I think there were lots of people that weren't maybe aware of WordWall at the time, but certainly um, lots of people are aware of it now. And then more recently, um, a couple of weeks ago, we had the primary school teacher, Ellie uh, Chettle Cully, who uh, shared uh, lots of ideas around her primary practice, one of which was was WordWall, and she actually demonstrated some different activities in WordWall and how they work as well. So that was really, really awesome. Um, so I think certainly uh, those sorts of um, those sorts of tools have proved very popular from an engagement point of view by people in the MFL Twitter art. And I'm sure if you haven't heard of them, um, I would give them a try out with your your classes as well. And finally, in this particular section. Um, as you can imagine, motivation and engagement, that's a question that comes up all the time. I, um, I crowdsourced the MFL Twitterati in preparation for another, another keynote. I, I gave a keynote for the Goethe Institute back in June of last year in the UK and um, asked, the, you know, asked the question, how do you maintain motivation? And these are all the answers which came up from the MFL Twitterati, and I've just condensed them into, um, into different bullet points. So I really love the way that the first item is, you know, like a soft skill, be as positive and encouraging as possible, praise students when they deserve it, let them know that you care. I can't say that strongly enough. I think that um, this has been an incredibly worrying time for everybody. It's all very well talking about the tools and everything, but unless you've got that initial uh, engagement, that, that good relationship with the class, and I'm not saying that's easy to do that uh, when you're teaching remotely, but if you have that and, you know, being as positive as possible and even, even if you're doing like a screencast the fact that the children can hear your voice i think is incredibly important that's why i think the idea behind digital praise postcards as well whereby you you create a postcard you add in a, a, a audio qr code from say vocary or quicker and you send it to them with your voice saying what a great piece of work they've done i think that's a really nice idea and then as you can see on the screen there are there's a variety of different tools that are mentioned i'm going to talk about feedback um later on in an, in another session if we have that I've got lots of ideas around feedback, but as you can see there, uh, you've got different ways of giving feedback using, say, Padlet or uh, Class Notebook or OneNote or Google Docs, quick conversations and so on and so forth. Um, lots of short and snappy tasks, I think, again, for sort of opening um, uh, starter activities or, or you know, keeping up the engagement and motivation by having lots of quick tasks, although I think everything takes longer when you're teaching online, having said that. Um, having little competitions, um, having you know games where you're like uh, racing across the screen, like say Quizlet Live or or WordWall and uh, or um, Block It and things like that. I think those are all really really important. So there you are. And so again, um, I'm going to hand over to Philippa, and we're probably going to wrap up quite soon. I think for this particular session because we were going to go for about 40 minutes to an hour. So over to you, Philippa. If you want to, um, please tell us about how EP can help with. Um, sustaining motivation during this uh, this very difficult time. Over to you, Philippa. Sure, thank you, John. Once again, so many great ideas there, and I'm, I'm really interested to try WordWall myself, looking at all those different games and see how they work embedded in EP as well, because I have a feeling that could be quite a, a good option there as well. Um, so yeah, in terms of engagement and motivation, um, there's a few factors um, that I can touch on briefly. Um, the first one is within EP, we've got a built-in game function called Dash. And so what happens with Dash is that when students complete a lesson, um, it automatically unlocks Dash and the students, it recycles questions from the lesson and students compete against each other. So they kind of have little rocket ships that go along the top of the screen. And then um, it's great because they love the competition side of it and the gamification, but it's also a wonderful way to um, repeat and recycle the language and reinforce what they've learned during that lesson. So that's one option. Um, I'll go into screen share again. Um, we've also got um, a, a competition, a built-in competition function in EP. So uh, we run a number of competitions throughout the year. So that's something to look out for. But also teachers can create their own competitions. So um, if you just click on the competitions tab here, 
it's really easy to create a competition. You just click on new competition, you give it a name. So it might be, you know, um, year seven, oh, sorry, I can't spell this morning, year seven French competition, or you could give it a much more exciting name. Um, you can choose the classes that you want to be in it. And it can either be just within one class, it can be between multiple classes, it can be for the whole school. So it's really up to you to personalize it. And then um, you can choose what content you want it to be based on. So it could either be based on a specific, really specific content, so a lesson or a series of lessons, or it can be based on a whole subject. So it's really up to you to kind of tailor the competition to your needs. Then you can choose the date. So it can either run for an hour, a week, a month, however long you want it to run for. And if it's if you're wanting it just to sort of increase um, motivation and engagement, I'd suggest sort of a short term, you know, it might be over a week or it might be just over the one hour you have your, that you want your students to focus on something. So it's really up to you to decide on that. And then um, you just create the competition and what it will do is generate a scoreboard. You can send that scoreboard to the students. It will also come up on their screen when they log in and they can see where they're at in the class. And you can also download um, templates to make certificates as well. So you can, if you're fully online, you can make digital certificates and email them to the students. Or if you do have some um, contact time, you could present them to the students if the school requirements around social distancing will allow you to do that. So those are just a couple of um, ways of engaging students, motivating students within EP. Also, I think just showing students what you can see um, in terms of their progress, you get some really thorough data tracking through the EP platform and just showing them what you can access so they know that you can see what they're doing is really um, quite motivating for them. So it's not they don't just think they're doing all this work and then the teacher doesn't see it. It's, um, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's showing them that you can see it. And even within our task function, you can send them little uh, motivational messages as well. So um, if I go into tasks, and just quickly show you a sample report of the data you see once the students have done a task. So you can show them this data as a start and you can, if you don't wanna show them real life student data, you can show them the sample report. So you can, they can see exactly what you can see that they're up to. Um, and this is where you can also give feedback and you can show them that you can see their written answers. Um, so they know that it's not just going into an empty space. Um, but also here you can send them little quick motivation, motivational messages. So you can click on their name and just click on message there and you can write them a short message. You can send them a little sticker. Um, so it's a great way of encouraging them and, um, and motivating them as well and, and getting that um, just a little bit of positive reinforcement. And I know Joe mentioned that um, in his section as well. So those are just a few ideas of how you can use EP um, to kind of engage and motivate students in this challenging time. So um, as Joe said, I think we probably should wrap up there because we've been nearly going for an hour. Um, we don't want to keep you too long. I know that you're all very, very busy. But what we'll do is we'll set up a follow-up session where we can address some of the other questions that have come up. Like we said, we were inundated with questions. Um, so some of the other topics that we had come up were um, planning in a remote and blended learning environment, so looking at how to plan. Um, then giving feedback in a remote and blended learning environment, and then um, assessment and authenticity in a remote and blended learning environment, and um, teaching ideas in a remote and blended learning environment for primary learners. So you can see loads of questions still to come. Um, so we will <laughs> we'll email out in the next few days about a time for a follow-up session. It will probably be in about two weeks' time, and we'll address some more of those questions. So. Um, yeah, it's been wonderful to have you here. If people have got, there haven't been too many questions come up in the chat, and I think I've answered most of the ones that have come up. They've been more technical ones. Um, but if you do have questions, please do um, pop them in the chat, and we can I can address, Joe can talk through those if you've got any questions in relation to what I've said or what Joe has said. And um, in the meantime, if you um, wanted to sign up for an EP account, if you don't already have access to EP, I'm just putting a link there um, that you can click on to sign up for EP, an EP account if you'd like to do so. So you can, should be able to click on that link on your screen. But otherwise, feel free to pop any questions in the Q&A and, um, and we can chat through those. Otherwise, enjoy the, enjoy the rest of your day. I know we've got people at all times of the day, so it might be the morning, it might be the evening, it might be the afternoon. So whatever time of day it is, enjoy the rest of it. 
um, and we'll send out the information about the follow-up session um, very soon. Thanks ever so much, everyone, for coming along. Really appreciate it. And I hope I've tried my best to answer all your questions. Uh, if you have any other questions, just let me know and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. But yeah, we've, we've done half the presentation. We've still got lots of questions to answer uh, for next time. So I can't wait to uh, get going with those as well in a couple of weeks' time. And you'll be sent details all about that, which is lovely. Thanks again ever so much to Philippa for, for being such a fantastic host. It's been a real pleasure to take part in, uh, for me, this evening's, for someone else, it might be this morning's, et cetera this uh, this uh, session always a pleasure to work with ep thank you joe thank you and thank you again for all your amazing suggestions Okay, well, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. So thank you again, and we'll see you again at, at the part two of the session. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.